Uh, Paul is 29. He's run 145 for 800, 335 for 1500, finished fourth in the European 1500 meter final in 2014. And of course, that epic race at Nationals is the reigning outdoor senior 1500 meter champion. And Dara has... He's only 20 years old, the kid amongst them, and uh, he has smashed the records, the youth and junior Irish records on the way up. He's run 345 for 1500, 801 for 3K, and 1354 for 5K, all as a junior. And of course, he's the European bronze medalist at under 20 level last year, over 5,000 metres. So three of Ireland's best middle and long distance runners we have with us. And I'm going to kind of over the next hour talk, try and get an insight into how they go about things. What they've learned, I guess, over the journey in terms of injuries, nutrition, training, strength training. Basically, we're going to ask them, pick their brains to get as much knowledge as we can. Um, so I might as well start with training and current training. We're obviously in the depths of winter at the moment, about too many races on the horizon. Um, I'd like to get an insight, I suppose, from you. What is a typical week's training look like for you at this time of year? And uh, I suppose, Dara, you're the youngest. You may as well start us off. What's on the schedule for you kind of this week? Um, yeah, so at the moment, um, like a typical week for me looks like um, kind of in around 80 miles a week. Um, so I just do a session on a Tuesday and a Friday, a uh, long run on a Sunday, and then just all easy running in between. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of like gym and stuff, I try and get to the gym maybe twice a week as well. So say probably the day after a session, so Wednesdays and Saturdays um, when I can. Um, but yeah, like it's so it's you know it's it's nothing too uh, nothing too mad at the moment. I think just because uh, I think people who are probably patient and consistent with their training at the moment, just because of the lack of races, um, you know, will probably be more rewarded than though, like you know maybe going out of two hours because because there's nothing else to do. It is it's easy to do that. You know, I found that myself quite a lot this year. That like you know when there hasn't been a race on like the immediate horizon, you're kind of tempted to just like. Just I don't know, just go harder than you should in sessions and etc. But um, no, it trends it's going like it's going the trends going well and it's that would be my kind of my usual volume in and around it. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's a session on Tuesday and a Friday and then just longer on Sunday and just keeping it simple really. And at this time of year, what would those two sessions typically be? Um, so this week now I did a so I did two sets of just five, four, three, two, one minutes on Tuesday. Um, off a minute recovery so that probably ends up being just short of 8 miles in terms of the actual bulk of the session and then tomorrow morning um, doing like a 10 minute tempo in the morning so probably 10 minutes at about like 5.05 pace or so per mile and then um, two sets of 6 by 45 second hills so it's just that you know like it is predominantly kind of strength work even this week is actually probably a bit of um, an advancement on what I have been doing like until now <clears throat> it's been lots of just uh, kind of long, steady aerobic stuff, like, you know, like progression runs five by seven minutes at kind of maybe like aerobic threshold, like five or five to five ten. Um, nothing too strenuous, you know, just because, as I said, I just feel that this side of Christmas, especially if I can just if I can just keep on logging the weeks and be consistent, that I think that's probably the best way to set me up for, you know, potential races in February or March. Excellent. And Amy, what's a typical week of training look like for you at the moment? So I would be on like low 50s mile wise and then my Monday I would do seven miles easy running and gym. Um, so obviously home gym at the moment but like before all this I would just go to the gym on Monday and Friday. Um, Tuesdays then is a session and that could be anything from like kilometer reps, mile reps and then maybe like shorter efforts at the end. Um, again like what Dara was saying nothing too crazy. Like, I feel like it is a time where you want to finish all your sessions where you're like, okay, like, I'm not absolutely ready to hit the floor just because there isn't anything major coming up. Um, Wednesdays, then, is just an easy run, normally around seven miles. Uh, Thursday is my long run. Um, and I do, like, pick up miles, so my last three miles would be quicker. Um, and the first bit, so it's 11 miles altogether, that would be my long run. Um, the first bit would just be easy running. Um, Friday then is gym and a run, another like seven mile easy run. Saturday then is a session in Mullingar. Um, so it's on the canal bank and we would do um, same thing like mile reps, kilometer reps, that kind of stuff. And then maybe like 200 at the end. Again, like a hard effort, but nothing to the point where you're like wanting to vomit. 
and then Sunday is my rest day. Um, I'd always take a rest day once a week. So, yeah, that's how my week looks like now at the moment. Good stuff. And over to you, Paul. What's your typical week? Yeah, so I'm pretty much just in like a, an aerobic kind of base phase at the moment. After the track season, I kind of like I took maybe two weeks off um completely off and then just kind of maybe started jogging for two weeks and then pretty much i'd say for maybe the last six weeks i've just kind of my my kind of training is just based around training to nearly be able to train in january so it's literally two sessions a week it's nothing fancy at all it's just uh jog on a monday jog on a tuesday um I usually run an hour every morning and if I feel like it, depending on how the week's going, I'll, I'll run half an hour again on the in the evening. So I don't really count mileage, but it would kind of vary from maybe at least 70 miles and could get up to over 80, 85 maybe if I, if I run every evening. But it usually looks like an hour Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, then I would do 10K at threshold. So for me at the moment, my threshold would maybe be 515 to 510 and then i probably i would definitely always run again on a session day just because i'd like to keep that day a bit harder than the other days um thursday i would again run at least an hour in the morning Um friday would always kind of take friday a little bit easier so some days i mightn't run and then some days the max i'd run is maybe 40 minutes and then on a saturday i'm doing at the moment i'm doing a hill session out in holt which is pretty just pretty much just a 30 minute loop of some pretty pretty tough hills so that's definitely obviously the hardest thing we do during the week and it's kind of like a it's obviously you're running hills but it kind of feels like a fat leg session because the way we run it is we run hard up the hills and then we take it very easy on on the downhills and then on the flats we're probably running around around threshold pace so you know still nothing really specific still the fastest you're probably running is maybe getting close to a three minute k but nothing, nothing crazy. And then obviously I'd run, built my long run up to the most I'll do now is 15 miles, which is about an hour and 45 minutes. That's and then it. obviously we'll change, we'll, we'll change, that'll just change. That's it's, it's, I just look at that as a kind of a, a trainer block to get ready to be able to do a more specific training come, come probably January or whenever you want to get ready. Gotcha. And when you, when you all say, I'm sure threshold runs are weekly staple for all of you, but have you been in a lab measuring that kind of heart rate and have you figured out and when you go and do a threshold run, are you specifically looking at your watch for a heart rate or is it just more pace you kind of go by or feel? Uh, well, for me, I would have always went uh, from an early age uh, and would have got tested at least twice a year. Over the last couple of years, I've, I haven't really kind of haven't got tested maybe in a year just because I feel I don't really even usually wear a heart rate monitor anymore before because I know like when I say I'm running five tens I feel like I'm 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 way on the safe side like I could feel like I could probably run quicker but I always play it safe so I know I'm probably uh, I'm probably going too slow I would say at the moment on my thresholds. And Amy, so, are you looking uh, at the heart rate as well? Yeah, I would never really do those tests and stuff like I did one. Like a few years ago, and um, he said that my heart, he just, it just wouldn't work. So he was like, I'm not doing this. He was like, on the graph, it was like, you look like you're dying. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to do that ever again. Um, so yeah, I would be like, for tempos, if I was like on a Tuesday session, let's say I was doing like a two mile tempo, I sometimes do it on the track and sometimes I do it on the gastros and stuff. But like, I would try and hit like anything between 5.45 and six minutes um it just kind of depends sometimes the six minute effort feels like a 530 effort and sometimes the 545 feels like a cruising and then for my long run the tempo miles would be more controlled like 630 pace 650 pace even um but yeah i'd always go off pace never heart rate um yeah makes sense and dara how do you um, yeah, like I've done, I've done the test kind of every year since I was probably sixteen, um, and I think I think they're a great indicator. I think uh, I don't. Know, my own opinion of it would probably be that sticking to them too strictly, kind of. I don't know it can just go overcomplicate things a bit sometimes. Like I know, I know roughly where I should be um, on different types of sessions, and obviously I don't have as much experience as Paul, and probably don't have the same understanding of my body. But I would still feel that if I was told to do like, you know, like a 
just a tempo like a whatever distance like you know 10 minutes 15 minutes or and so on but like I know kind of roughly how it should feel so like I'd always keep an eye on the pace and keep an eye on the on the, the heart rate to make sure that I'm not uh, overreaching or underreaching but at the same time I think I think they, they serve a purpose but I think getting too hung up them can be can have a negative effect because what I found is that even though like you know a treadmill is a treadmill like so you do them like I've done all my tests on treadmills but I've done them in three different labs and like so I've done I did a lab in I did a test in a lab in Cork when I was 16 and my numbers have actually gotten worse in both my tests since even though like my fitness has got a lot better um I just I don't know I just find like cause I did one then in the institute and then in in Blanchetown and then did one here in UCD as well and I feel like even though fair enough you're running on a treadmill but like I just think like with something as uh sensitive as your heart rate I think like the likes of the heat in the room when you're doing it makes a big difference like how well prepared you are for it and all this type of thing so I think they're a great they're a great indicator and like they can keep you keep you on track to a degree but I would I wouldn't like if it was a day that I felt great like I wouldn't beat myself up over going five or ten seconds faster per mile than perhaps like my lab test would suggest that I should do like makes sense and a, a trick a trick cut there I, I i found i actually only wore my watch for a for a threshold there this week because i it was a new loop so i didn't actually know the loop but if i have a loop and i did this like last summer if i have a loop and i know how far it is i just run the loop without a watch because you know if one week i i, I would have found like early on i would have always wanted to see progression in my training so one week if i ran you know 30 two and a half minutes for 10k i'd want to come back the next week and try run 32 15 whereas this when you just take the watch off you can actually just focus on what you're meant to be doing you know and not forcing it and i think that's the main thing about a threshold you're not you're just running along knowing you can run for twice the distance again if need be yeah good rule of thumb and in terms of strength training then obviously it varies wildly among distance runners and middle distance runners who does some and who does a lot um, what approach do you take and do you feel it's necessary, I guess, for, you know, 1,500 metres to 5,000 metres? We, we start with you, Dara. Um, yeah, like, I, I do gym work. Um, uh, and to be honest, it's, like, it's by far, like, my least favourite, like, aspect of running. Like, I just, I don't get any sort of endorphins out of the gym. Don't get any way excited to go. Like, but it's kind of, I purely just see it as a as a box sticking session, like, you know, um, and I think I've kind of modified the way I do it recently that like, you know, I used to just have like a heap of exercises that I do and like, you know, there could be 15 to 20 different exercises I'm doing, like all body weight stuff. And it could be like, I'll just like an example now, like the one that comes to mind would be something like, you know, glute bridges and it'd be like three sets of 12 reps and things that you'd be in the gym for like two hours doing it. And I just, I just, to be honest, I just couldn't keep on doing it. I hated it. So I've kind of modified it now to a thing that I go in and basically like have the three, like have the two or three maybe main lifts or exercises that I'll do um, in terms of that I would probably see the most important for injury prevention and stuff like that. Um, and then in between times, then I have like a whole bank of exercises that I have and I'll just rotate like five or six of them in between times. Um, so I think like, not that I'm up the walls like with college work, but at the same time, I think like in terms of like if you're running a lot, like say at the moment like 80 miles a week is, even though I find like I can I can do it granted, it's quite new to me. Like it's still it's a lot more time training than I'm used to. So like if I'm doing that and I'm spending four hours in the gym a week, as well, I just think I'm doing too much. Like so I go in and I do probably two sessions of like 45 minutes to an hour a week. So I usually do them on a Wednesday and a Saturday, um, but. To be honest, I'd be quite inconsistent with my gym work a lot of the time, which probably isn't something that I should be saying, but I'd be just be, I, a lot of it just depends on the training for the week as well. I find if I'm in and around racing season, it's probably just, uh, it's probably just because I haven't done it that much, but I always, I'm afraid I'm going to tweak something or that, you know, I'm just going to have unnecessary fatigue in the body. Like, so I think from my own point of view, I think gym is the most important in times like now, because you're, doing off pure strength training and like you're trying to build the body for as Paul said for some hard training like and I think doing you know your two sessions a week at the moment and kind of taking that box is important and then for me like you know if I was in a full racing calendar now and you know you're racing every couple of weeks during the summer like I'd keep gym fairly minimal I'd just be doing pure maintenance work you know maybe a bit of band work and 
like general mobility and kind of strength in certain areas. But um, I think it's definitely like, you know, for me, anyway, it's definitely one of the harder aspects of running because I just think it's a bit of a bit of a grind, really. Like, um, so yeah, to be honest, any week where I get two decent gym sessions in the week, I see it as a box tick and no more, to be honest. Yeah. And Amy, how much are you doing? Well, I guess no one's in the gym these days, but either at home in terms of rehab, prehab or strength work. It's actually so gas because I'm literally the opposite to Dara. Like I love the gym. So like in a normal, like when we're not in lockdown, like going to the gym, I look forward to it so much. I go in the evening and I love the gym. I go to Limerick and it's just like my time, like I have my music on um, and I just love it. Um, I definitely think for me anyway, it's a massive part of my training in the sense of like injury prevention and to help your speed um but at home then I actually have like TRX ropes um and they've been a godsend I really feel like they've helped a lot so like I actually have my like my gym program up here like my coach will he's brilliant but so like today now I had to do I do plyometrics at the start of every session two gym sessions a week so I had to do like drop landing and pogos so like jumps um I personally love plyos like I think that they really do improve your speed um I find a difference I feel like when I don't do them um I feel a lot flatter and not as sharp as opposed to when I would be would they would be in my program and then I had to do like I have a school bag with weights and like a single leg box squat so I'm literally up against the rad like on the side of the wall and then hamstring curls which I do with my TRX ropes um, I'm actually supposed to do them with a the Swiss ball, but um, it just annoys me. So <laughs> I do, the, do it with the TRX ropes. Um, step ups um, at the back. So again, I have like my school bag on and I hold a book. Um, TRX inverted row. I do them in the normal gym as well. And then um, core, two core exercises, side plank, and then a hollow, hollow body hold. So um, yeah, that would be like a typical gym, gym session um, at home. And it's pretty similar in the actual gym except obviously with weights and stuff it's nothing too crazy it's definitely more like maintenance and a lot of like single leg stuff um piles core that kind of stuff but yeah i absolutely love the gym it's like the one thing i look forward to that and sessions like track sessions or just harder sessions um so yeah that would be me cool paul do you like it in the gym uh I, yeah i like going to the gym yeah I, i'd be more Along the lines of Dara, I, I, the jury's still out for me on, like, like what do you mean by strength? Like, uh, I suppose I, I'm I'm grouping a lot in. I mean, yeah. like injury prevention in terms of all terrible yeah, well, work well, and like, any sort of strengthening work, I guess. I would definitely be inconsistent with gym work, but like through and throughout my career, like at the moment, I'm I'm probably just doing injury prevention but like I, I would definitely swear by by plyometrics i think they make it make a huge difference and something i would have always done throughout my career and um, i never lifted a weight never did a deadlift or anything before around 145 and it was probably something that kind of became a lot more my training afterwards and still had some reason it still had some good results afterwards but i was never felt as fast as i was when i wasn't doing anyone doing them anyway you know but i would always think that plyometrics were very very important um i would definitely have done, gone through periods where i would have done like structured kind of gym gym sessions where you would have done deadlifts and rdls squats all that sort of stuff um but i think there's kind of like a time and a place for them and it's like it's like what dara said i i feel like because i'm doing so much running that like a lot of the time they can just be fatiguing because all of a sudden you could be training for like even on a session day, if we're training, I'm gone on, I feel like I'm on the go from maybe half nine to half 11 or 12 o'clock. And then I go to the gym and just with everything, it's probably going to take another 90 minutes and then I have to run again in the evening. So a lot, a lot of time I, f I found I've just got tired or, and a lot of times when I've overtrained, it's probably because I've been doing everything. Do you know what I mean? So I would always have, I would, probably looking back, you probably would have to substitute one of your runs or something. With, if you're going to really go down that, that line of actual proper strength training. But at the moment, like last summer, I, I, did, no, I did no strength training at all, no proper gym work just because, you know, of, of, of lockdown. And then I probably got lazy, but I would always done a little bit of core and a little bit of injury prevention, like, you know, just, just com completely basic body weight type stuff. Um, that would all, but I, I did get back into plyos last summer, which I felt 
helped a lot, you know. And I just feel if you want to get fast, you have to be running fast. You know, I still don't know how fast a deadlift is going to make you. Uh, the jury's just still still out for me. I, I understand it if you're a sprinter and you're trying to obviously you're, you enhance muscle growth, but as a middle distance runner, you're not really trying to do that. So. And in terms think, of your plyos that you mentioned, then what does that typically involve? Yeah, but I even period like I, I would be I would definitely periodize the plyos I do because right now I'm not doing any just simply because again. I find it's an injury risk. And for me, something I've noticed over the years, I try to minimize any of that sort of really explosive stuff that, you know, that's where I find all my injuries kind of come from. And um, so like in the summertime, I would have done plyos maybe t- twice a week where I would literally do just your single leg plyos, uh, maybe four by 12 hops on each leg, then four by double leg, then, you know, kind of your, like your knees up type plyo, your pogo jumps type plyo, that sort of stuff. And then I would get on the track and, and, and properly sprint. Whereas now I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about doing that now because I feel like I'm running 85 mile a week. I'm already fatigued. I don't want to add this extra fatigue on for what? There's no, there's no races coming on. So I will minimize that until, you know, there's a race that I want to get ready for and work back from that. Yeah, makes sense. And you all three of you were athletes who were winning a rake of juvenile and schools titles and now you're doing the same at senior level so you're kind of models in that sense of coming through and maturing well um obviously with all the bumps and injuries along the way and whatnot but i wanted to kind of go back and ask you about your early development in the sport um you know i think a lot of you probably played a bit of other sports and a, a question to all three would be like what point did you solely focus on athletics and did you feel when you were kind of juggling sports throughout your childhood or maybe even your teen years that it was beneficial in the end to athletics. Dara, I know you were a good footballer, so you can take this one off. Um, yeah, so I I think I gave up uh, all the other sides playing, I was playing football and soccer quite a lot. Um, from like I started running as well when I was eight, so I was basically just doing the three, the three of those, like with a, like um, three of those predominantly until I was fifteen, and then I gave up football and soccer in the same year, and I think. Uh, like I certainly wouldn't have given up if I went back, you know, because like I think like you know if you look back to like All Ireland Championship races when I was like under thirteen, under fourteen, stuff like that, and like like I wasn't always winning them, you know, like I was always in and around it. Like I've a lot of like between third and kind of like sixth and seventh and all these kind of results when I was that age, and like you know looking back, like that was plenty for that age, really. Do you know what I mean? Because like you know if you go to if you go to like a, a a national, like this could just be me now, but if I go to like a national cross now, like, and I see the person who's winning the under thirteen boys race, like, I'm actually just thinking like you're just not going to see you in a few years, like, you know what I mean? Because like there was people my age who gave up everything when they were like ten, like, and like they're not they're not still running now, like, you know, I'm sh- and obviously there's outliers. That's not everybody, but I just feel like I feel like if you're going to be running properly, like that it's so intense that I just, I think it's too intense for a thirteen fourteen year old, you know, like because. Like it, literally, it, like it, the decision made itself for me really when I was like 15. Um, like I joined a new training group. I was just being coached at, at home, and then I kind of joined my first proper training group. Um, with Steve Matson, who I can see is on the ball here, so I better make sure I'm saying all the right things. Well, so I joined him when I was 15, and then I think the decision just made itself then because like all of a sudden I was running five times a week, um, and I just didn't really have time to be doing the other things. And I think like with every bit of kind of success that I got in athletics, like it just, it just made everything else. It just belittled my other like sports and stuff. I just didn't get the same like, I just didn't get the same buzz for like winning winning a soccer match on a Saturday morning or you know going to GA training and all these things I used to love. Like I think just once you got a taste of success in athletics, that was just it. Kind of made its decision for me. And so then it well, was you like you very much were happy that you kept up the other sports for you until you were fourteen, fifteen or so, rather than yeah, specialising like, at like ten or twelve. Yeah, I I definitely think it would have had a negative effect on me. Like, and I even think, uh, I think my, like even like definitely like mentally and stuff. Because I mean, I still feel very, in a way, I still feel kind of like fresh to athletics. Even though like I've been running since I was eight, I feel like I'm only really have that's only been my sole focus probably for like five years. And before that, like I really just ran just because it was enjoyable and stuff. I didn't take it seriously. So I feel like that kind of just it kept it like fresh in my mind. And then I think. Even my body as well. Like I remember, like we go like training on a Saturday morning. We just really like 
twisty course in Saren Woods in Cork and I just used to notice that like I'd be going around the corner and I was like I was way I was really way more agile than the lads I was running with because like I think like you teach your body to be more in one dimensional in the other sports was like you know running is obviously so linear that like the whole kind of turning sideways and stuff like that like isn't really like developed at all like and I actually think that's kind of helped me now it could just be a coincidence but like I essentially went the first like four years of my running career without the slightest of a niggle like like I never got injured um and I just feel like my body was hardened up from like doing other things when I was younger um like in the last now like six or seven months I've had a couple of like small injuries I had just like an issue in my Achilles and a bit of bursitis in my knee but they both want to kept me up for like two or three weeks or whatever but I definitely think that just doing other things when you were younger like I just think it's I think it's just healthy for your development to be honest like even just as a person as much as as an athlete like yeah Amy how long has running been your sole sporting pursuit so I I would consider myself late as well to start running I started in secondary school um the end of first year but all since I was five I was an Irish dancer and like if you don't know anything about Irish dancing at the top level it's no joke it's really serious and I feel like from age five onwards maybe more so like nine ten eleven like I was immersed in a world that was like cutthroat like it was like I feel like I got that mental edge that kind of translated into running from Irish dancing and it was really serious like when I used to go to Cork three times a week from Limerick um and we used to travel to like the world's North Americans the Great Britons all the major championships um but it was really intense and I feel like, so I kept Irish dancing until I was 16. Um, but again, it wasn't like for fun, it was serious. And like there was, so the qualifiers for the world championships is the Monsters and they're on in November. And I remember like for maybe like under 14, under 15-ish cross country all Ireland, the Monsters were on the Saturday and then I would, so dance in them. And then the All-Ireland Cross Country was on the Sunday. So I'd have like two like mahogany legs from the Irish dancing on the Saturday and then straight up to Cross Country, which is like the polar opposite of Irish dancing. Um, but I would have done like, you know, the usual soccer, hockey and all that in school. But I think for me, it wasn't really different difference because I like running and Irish dancing, I did them both at a serious level. But it was nice being able to do, like, jump from dancing competition to a running competition. Um, but um, again, like what Dara was saying, I think it's nice to have a kind of a distraction. You know, like, I think 13, 14, zooming in on one sport is too, it's too much. Um, and I, I really do think at 16, 17 is the age where you have to pick. Just because that's kind of where you're, you know, going into fifth and sixth year in school, and if you do want to start competing at a high level in running, um, you, you just need the time for like studying and for schoolwork and for a normal life, you know, like to meet your friends and stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, that's I started running at about 14. And like, it's funny because I think that Irish dancing helped me so much in terms of like, it's all jumping like, so it's all plyos. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I definitely think I had like that serious mentality um when I started running like when I started running I won my first All-Ireland and I wasn't like shocked that I, I kind of turned up at that age and I was like well I'm only here to win like that was just the way I thought and then it kind of that was the, how I set it from there um and went on through my juvenile career but I definitely think that the Irish dancing helped me in so many ways um for running like cool and Paul when did you? Uh, what was the question there again, Cole? Uh, what, sports, <laughs> what other sports did you do as a kid? And uh, when did you kind of physically... Yeah, I wish sports? I never gave up playing football, to be honest with you. Uh, no, but I uh, I would have started out yeah playing. I did all sports. I, I swam. I played uh, soccer. I played Gaelic. And I ran. Uh, pretty much did that up until I was maybe like the first time I ever just solely concentrated on one was when I was maybe 12 or 13. And... I made a representative squad to go down to the Kennedy Cup because ultimately I, I wanted to be a footballer. Like that's what I wanted to do. And that was kind of my first real experience of, um, you know, pr- probably choosing something and having, a, you know, a focused kind of goal. And then I kind of just, whatever, it didn't really kind of work out for me. And I kind of got to the stage where like I was always a, a better runner looking back than I was a footballer. Um, but that's what I wanted to be. And then 
I think I went to the Candy Cup and it didn't work out. I kind of like was getting, I was getting dropped and stuff. And then kind of was like not even able, I was making some good teams that like, I was just a sub now. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, well, you know, all right, still good achievement to get here, but I want to actually be, be doing the sport. So I came a little bit disillusioned with it, stuck with it for another year. to, pro- And then I went away to another tournament. Same thing happened. Like I was only 14 so I hadn't really kind of developed properly. And then I was a lot, a lot of the lads were a lot bigger and stuff like that. So I just, I, I just became kind of just frustrated with the sport really. And then I said to my dad, I was like, okay, I just want to focus on running for this year. And then, you know, I kind of, I won my first all Ireland that indoor season. And I, I just didn't really kind of look, look back since really that was kind of the decision it was kind of probably forced because i was terrible at football it was just a forced decision no but i liked i liked more so the uh the the sole kind of responsibility as an athlete you didn't really need to depend on on anyone you always kind of got your chance to to race and 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 train and compete so that was kind of what kind of edged it for me really Excellent. And just before I ask the next question, I'll drop a reminder because we're past the halfway point. If anyone does have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and I'll ask them in the last 10 minutes. Um, if not, I'll just carry on with my own questions until the end of the hour. Um, as sick as the air of them. Um, if we move on, another aspect I suppose that distance runners vary so much on is nutrition. Some people are kind of Nazis about it in terms of taking care of everything and other people, even really good runners, paid no attention to it. Um, could you, each of you, explain, I guess, how closely do you monitor what you're taking in? Do you work with nutritionists? Do you take supplements? And if so, why? And again, I suppose if we start back with Dara. Um, yeah, so I'd, yeah, I'd say I take my nutrition, uh, maybe not seriously, but like I'd eat, I just eat generally well. Like, um, you know, and I think, uh, like, I, work, I do work with nutritionists here in UCD, um, but to be honest, like, the work is fairly minimal, like, Basically, I met up with him the first week of first year last year. Kind of, he wanted me to make out a food diary, so I did that and showed it to him. He said, "Yeah, that's fairly spot on. Just work away." Like, because I think like overcomplicating food and stuff, unless like you've a love for cooking and you know making exotic food and all that. Like, I eat fairly basic food. Like, like day to day, like I just get up, have a coffee, go for a run, come back, and then just have a big bowl of porridge. Um, then for lunch, you just have eggs and toast, and then just have a big dinner, have toast before bed, and that essentially it like um because i think like you know i think and it's it's kind of something i think with all like the the so-called one percent is that like you know you like keeping him keeping him on track is obviously important but at the same time like i think giving too much attention to any of them is is bad like you know because it's one of those things like if you if you go into the gym like and you're chatting to your gym coach like you'll leave and all of a sudden the most important thing in the world is the gym like and it's the same thing like nutritionist physio any of these things like they'll make they'll make their market sound like it's the most important thing when essentially like the most important thing is your training like so like i'd be conscious of eating well and you know hydrating well and all that type of stuff but in terms of in terms of being really strict with like calorie counting or anything like that like absolutely not like like i'd be i'd be sure to get like a decent meal in like you know with plenty of carbs and plenty of protein like you know half an hour after a training session like either either just a small run or like a, a session or whatever but in terms of like calorie counting and you know making sure there's vitamin b c and d in every meal that's i don't really go that far to be honest um but then again i would be confident in my diet that it's like i'm taking most of the boxes and you know it's food that suits me and that's about the size of it really like yep amy what's your approach with nutrition yeah it's i'd be very chilled about it as well like I feel like I have this mentality where, you know, around this time of year, I eat whatever I want. Like if I'm out with my friends and we want to pick out, I will absolutely, I don't think about food at all. And then coming up to racing season, I just feel like, you know, things get more serious. And again, it's like all those little one percenters. So I would like maybe avoid the extra packet of jellies. I I just feel like, here, I don't need this today. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't work with a nutritionist. No, like a typical day for me would be like, I get up, I have porridge and toast. I love toast. I have toast with literally everything. But I don't have dairy. I um, have like coconut milk for the most part. And I also have spelt bread, um, which is actually really nice, by the way, if anyone wants to try it. So yeah, my breakfast would be porridge and tea and toast. And then my lunch would be like couscous, a smoothie, um, like chicken, salmon, um, again, like Dara was saying, like basic things, nothing fancy, and I eat pretty much sim- the same things all the time. Um, 
I'd also have hot chocolate and toast with my lunch every day. And then I have a snack before, like, I run like six o'clock, like we eat at weird times in my house. So like, I have like, again, tea and toast. And then for my dinner, I'd have like, you know, salmon, rice, veg, um, chicken, all the your usual things. And then before bed, I also have a cereal and tea and toast. Um, so yeah, that's me. But yeah, it's not so, I don't supplements. Eat. Uh, I take vitamins like vitamin C and bioacidophilus for your gut health, um, but that's it. It's it's just definitely not something I look into too much. I have like a, hab- a habit and I do the same thing day after day and that's it really. Cool. Paul? Um, yeah, it was probably something earlier on my career. I would have uh, Listen, I would have always eat, uh, ate healthy and would have always had enough energy to, to do the training I needed to do and never would have had to really watch kind of what I ate pretty much because like like Dara and, and Amy were saying, like I, I was covering pretty much the basics of eating healthy throughout the day. I, I never really worked with a, a nutritionist or nothing like that. And it's probably something uh, I kind of like, once I started training with the Melbourne Track Club, I kind of, obviously my home cooking through my mother was, was brilliant and very healthy. And then obviously when I moved away, you know, I kind of became more aware just of what I was eating because you're forced to cook for four or five different athletes that you're you're just inherently cooking healthy food anyway but i would never watch what i was eating or i would never worry about snacking at all because i think just for for how much exercise i was doing weight issues were never really a problem it's only something that i've had to really kind of focus on in the last year or so i don't know maybe it's because i'm i'm getting older now and the metabolism is is slowing down but it's something for the first time in my career i, I had to address this summer and it was it was probably just payback for how much it, <laughs> i abused my body pre pre Christmas because I would always hover around, you know, seventy one kilo uh since I've been twenty one, you know, and then all of a sudden going to Australia I'm 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 seventy six kilo or seventy seven kilo and thinking, oh this is gonna be fine. I'm just gonna go and train hard and I'll obviously shift this excess weight. And then I came home after after whatever it was, three months of plus 70 miles a week and I was still 75 kilo and I'm going what what is going on here like this I'm gonna to have to address this through what I'm eating so pretty much became I had to educate myself rapidly on on how to make sure I had enough energy but also making sure I was kind of losing weight and getting to race weight and thankfully I had enough time to do it like I didn't have to do anything extreme but it literally just came down to watching what I was eating and making sure every meal was more so aimed at supplying the energy or the or getting the su- sufficient carbohydrates and then also getting sufficient protein uh, post-workouts, but also not uh, cutting out anything that was refined or sugary or that was just going to be excess food. So that was a bit of a drain, to be honest with you, because all of a sudden you don't get to enjoy your diet as much. But listen, I, it, it's up my... I think as I get older, I think it's more important. And supplements, do you take any of them? Yeah, so I don't take any supplements. Like, I just, all I've taken at the moment is protein. Uh, like, so just your normal Connecticut protein after after training. I would have done early on in my career, but not a, I think, I think you can get everything you need through, through diet pretty much at the moment. Yeah, good message. And I guess every athlete, especially distance runners, I think it was Brendan Foster said that the majority of distance runners wake up tired and go to bed exhausted. Um, how, how do each of you find the balance, I guess? Because I'm sure you've all at times over the balance and either you're run down, you're sick, or of course you're injured. How did you get to the current kind of sweet spot and work out that this is the amount I can sustain? I guess the optimal amount rather than the maximum amount. Dara? Um, yeah, for me, I think... Um and it, it certainly isn't a brag, but I think like mostly through like careful planning from my coaches, like I actually, I don't really think I've ever been massively tipped over the edge. The only time I'd feel it sometimes is that at the end of a track season. Um, but I think I'd get that more from just the races. I think, yeah, I, I tend to have a, in the summer, I tend to just have a fairly short window where I race really, really well. And then I decide that I'm either a little bit, a little bit, I don't know, groggy or just a bit rusty. And then, you know, once I've had my couple of really good races, I tend to just, I don't know, the, I don't know, maybe just the bite in me with the race tends to, tends to like diminish a little bit. But in terms of training, I think like I've just been really lucky the whole way up that like my coach has always kept it 
fairly under control. And I think that's probably uh, probably a question that I'd answer better in 10 years' time when I've had more experience of, you know, maybe going and training too hard or not training hard enough. But so far, I feel like I've had the balance fairly right. Um, if anything, I've always kind of wanted to do a little bit more, like, um, but then again, like, you know, it hasn't always, I mean, like, there's, um, there's certainly been times, you know, where, you know, you're coming into a season and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, I haven't trained hard enough and stuff like that. But I think a lot of the time you need to, you need to trust it early doors because, um, you know, a lot of the time you don't need to, you don't, you don't need to kill yourself in training in terms of have a good result. Like, um, but yeah, for me, I, I think, and I, I put a hundred percent of that towards my coaches rather than to myself because at the end of the day, I'm just doing what I'm told. Like, um, and had I had the reins on myself, I'd probably be going a little bit harder. But I think I've always raced better when I've been coming in fresh rather than, you know, rather than flog myself in training. So, um, I think, yeah, I think just generally, like, you know, maybe if you're coming towards the end of what I find is like, you know, maybe like the last, like I take a rest day every week as well. Um, and I think like sometimes maybe like the last day before your rest day, you kind of feel like you need to just take a day off. Like, and I think that kind of keeps you in check as well, having that day off a week. Um, but no, I've definitely really been lucky that way that I don't feel like I've had a sustained amount of time where I've, you know, like fallen over the edge or anything like that. Yeah. And Amy, have you overdone it at times in the past? And if so, what did you learn from kind of those experiences? Um, no, I actually, when I was younger, like maybe 18, 19, I used to go through this phase where it was around March time and I don't know why because I wasn't exactly exerting myself that much at that age. I would just uh, like hit a slump and I would like hate running and just be dramatic and be like, I'm giving up. And then it would just pass over after a week. I don't know what it was. Um, now at the moment and like as I'm older and stuff, no, like I feel like, you know, my coach Joe was brilliant and he keeps everything like under controlled and I'm never like oh I feel burned out or anything um the one thing I would say is like my periods like oftentimes there are certain points in the uh, month where I would feel sluggish but like we address that and I'm just like oh like I have my period so that's why I feel shitty um my sleep isn't the best I've always just been a bad sleeper um and I've tried to address it but like my body just doesn't want to sleep um I would be a big napper so I guess um I'd probably make up for it in that regard um, but I do think sleep is really important and I think like with training the thing is just to not get like worked up about it and just kind of take each week by week as normal because I think the problem arises when you start to get stressed and you know what Dara's saying like you're coming into competition and you're like oh have I done this oh have I done that could I've done that better whereas like no like you are exactly where you need to be and you just have to keep remembering that um, but yeah I think like recovery wise, recovery wise I would just try and like sleep um like nap during the day if I can and just really monitor things um like day by day and just like hold myself accountable for recovery and all that kind of stuff gotcha and Paul how do you know when how much is too much uh, I think I just I've 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 had to accept over the last maybe three or four years that I'm not going to be like a, a world-class five or 10k runner <laughs> I think that's pretty much it I kind of realized that that uh you know, my, my training would, like, if you look at my training, I predominantly train like a 5K or a 10K runner. Um, but I think, you know, the most of the times where I've experienced overtraining is, is getting ready for cross country, like properly getting ready. Any times I've ran it was when I, and I've, I, I ultimately ran my best, was when I, the ultimate goal was the 1500 in the summer and I was just naturally in good shape but anytime I've tried to force those sessions um, I just can't seem to handle it and I, I just kind of get into just get into a hole so that's kind of something I've just had to accept that you know I'm probably never going to be uh, be really really competitive at a, at a high level over those distances so I just accept it now and I think um, it just makes your train and be a lot more specific to what you're actually trying to do and it's kind of something that you know, I definitely feel tired in training all the time, but it's different feeling tired in your aerobic or your base phase when you know you have nothing really getting ready for. So, like, there's no real pressure. But when you're tired and then all of a sudden you got a race coming up and you're you're trying to do your training, but also trying to kind of rest up, that's that's where the that's where the uh, that's where the trouble can can happen and you and you find yourself you get you get yourself into a hole. But like as I said, right now with my base phase, it's a different tiredness. 
than you would feel come the summer. It's just it's just a grind at the moment. But again, I've it's easier when you've just accepted that. Okay, I'm 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 just going to feel like this, and nothing's really really intense. So, yeah. Cool. Does that kind of make sense? Yep, perfect you know? sense. And back over to Dara. Um, is I guess maybe you're too young to answer this, but like looking back over the last number of years, is there any kind of mistakes or things? you think if, if you had, say, a younger brother or a different club mate coming up behind you that you, maybe you would advise them to do to try and avoid similar mistakes? Um, yeah, like, I, like there, there definitely is. Like, I think, um, like, as I, like, kind of alluded to earlier, like, kind of the, the constant wanting to do a little bit more, like, probably has probably hindered me at certain stages. I think, like, and I kind of like getting the, getting the pat, pat on the back, like, from my coach, like, after sessions as well. So, like, a lot of the time, you know, like like my last rep, like regardless of how I'm feeling, like I'm always just trying to make that my fastest. Just like, and you know, sometimes I'm kind of thinking like, why am I even doing it? Because like, it's only me and my coach who sees my training anyway. It's not like, so I, I wouldn't really post publicly to Strava or, you know, post my training that much. So like, a lot of the time, like, you know, I've definitely just kind of got a little bit trapped in the whole, like wanting to see myself improve too much and maybe too fast. Like I think, um, it's funny, like what Paul said earlier about his threshold runs doing him on the same loop. Like I think that's actually it's funny because that's something that's actually probably had a negative effect on my training. I used to just do a a progression run, like when I was younger mostly, um, around a certain loop and I think it just got to the stage where like you know, it was in cross country season and I'd done a really good one in September and then in you know, like probably about three or four weeks later I was doing it again and like when I was going out to train I was just saying to myself no matter what happens, it has to be faster than the last time. And like, looking back, it's so stupid because it was an issue only for myself and my coach that was going to see it anyway. Um, so I think learning to just, you know, hold back, hold yourself back a little bit sometimes. Um, you know, and I think one thing I've definitely learned as well is to just take the easy days easy. There was one, there was one year where I just got it into my head that 6.40 a mile was like my, my easy run pace. And I just decided on that. And so I had like, you know, if I was told to do a 50 minute run, I was like, grand, okay, seven and a half miles done in that distance. Whereas I've gone completely the other way now, whereas I'd probably do my easier run slower than, you know, the majority of like, you know, 15 or 16 minute 5k athletes. Like, I just, I just love going out running slow, like the day after a session and even before a session and stuff. And I think just kind of trying to stop prove, like, like in your training, like you don't really prove anything, you know, it's all about what you do in the race. Like, so I think maybe just, taking taking the foot off the gas and training a small bit because like funnily enough like the year that I decided 640 was my easy pace and I did all my runs at that pace it was probably like my worst year of running and like it was completely it was completely self-inflicted like nobody told me to run a 640 I kind of just got a notion that that was what I should be doing so I think like definitely I'd be telling people now like especially in the the development years like 15 16 just just slow down like massively on your easy ones like I'd be I'd be liable now, like in the mornings, especially I usually do my morning run off just a coffee and it's usually only like four to five miles, but like, like five miles could take me 40 minutes plus, like I'll just absolutely plod like, and then I always feel great in the evening because you've been kind of cobwebs blown off like, um, so I think, yeah, like trying to just make sure that you save, you save your best performances for the race day and you don't kind of leave it out there a month early and like, you know, on your home track or whatever, it's really important. Like. Yeah. And Amy, is there anything you've realised now that maybe you wish you knew or think others should know at the age of 18, 19, 20? Yeah, I, I have a few things. So the first one I would say, and if this goes for all ages really, is not to run through an injury, a pain, whatever, it doesn't matter. I did this when I was 16, 17, 17. And I firmly think everything, I was smooth sailing up to then. And I ran through a stress reaction because I wanted to go to the European Youth Olympics and I didn't tell anyone. Um, and I think it genuinely took three, four, five years out of my career um, because it was a recurring injury for a few years. So my big thing is like, if you have a pain, doesn't matter how big, small, like actually address it, don't ignore it. And I think a lot of runners do make this mistake for some reason. We're always like, no, no, it's not there. Like ignore it. Just, yeah, it is there. Like accept that it is there. So that would be my first one was the biggest mistake I think for me was running through an injury. Um, the second one was, I'd say when I was in college in Ireland, um, I did enjoy myself a lot, like, and, but I didn't have the mentality back then that I do now. Um, and I guess it just came with maturity and age, but I think in college you do, if you want to reach really high levels, 
you have to act like that. And looking back, I probably did go out a bit too much. Like, obviously, go out, have fun. I'm not against that. Like, I think we, we do need that balance. But you have to know when to, like, say no, and especially coming up to a race and stuff. So that's another thing. Probably do regret going out as much as I did in college. It wasn't, like, massively excessive. But looking back now, if I was a bit more mature, I definitely could have, like, said no a few times when I should when I didn't. Um, another thing I think was not tracking my period earlier. Like now that I have started to do that and I see, okay, there are certain times in my cycle where I perform at a very high level. There are certain weeks where I can avoid, if possible, a race because I'm sluggish. Um, and I never took any attention um, to that go until I'd say two or three years ago. And now looking back, I'm like, oh, like I could have made some smart race decisions and actually understood. Like sometimes you'd be coming away from a race like so deflated and being like, OK, why did that go so bad? When looking back now, my period definitely like did have something to do with this. Um, so that was that's another thing. Like and if there are young people there or even people with young teenage girls, like that's one thing I would say. Start tracking their periods and just making a note of of when their period comes. And there is definitely trends like, you know. And then my last one would just be, I feel like I could have been braver in races. Like I always used to get comments from people being like, oh my God, like you looked like you're not even trying or like you did the bare minimum there to win. Um, and even like BMCs and stuff, I feel like I definitely held back when I was younger. Um, just out of fear, I guess. And uh, now looking back, I'm like, oh, I could have been more ruthless in certain races. And I feel like I have kind of adapted more of that kind of a mindset and I'm still working on that as I get older. But looking back now, I'm like, oh, I definitely could have been braver in races. So yeah, those would be mine. Great lessons. And Paul, what do you wish you knew when you were 18? Oof, is, have, we, have we got long enough, have we? Um, <laughs> I, I would definitely, yeah, just reiterate some of those points. Like 100% of one of the things I, I have learned is do just do not run when you're sore. Like it's so simple when you think about it, like you're sore for a reason don't run and it's even something like even through all the injuries i had like just the thoughts of just missing a day off you think your whole season is going to be messed up but it's not like your whole season gets messed up when you get properly injured you know so literally the the rule of thumb i have is uh, if i'm so anyway so slightest niggle uh and something new that is not something that I've been dealing with I know it's for a while but something new I'll take a day off and then if it's sore again when I run I'll take a week off and then I'll go see a physio and generally it's all it's generally if you catch something early 100% you're going to be good in a week like, do you know what I mean but yeah just don't run when you're sore uh, probably another one would be to train with a specific goal in, in mind like I see a lot of, of people with, and they're just training for the for the sake of training and I think when you're training for the sake of training, you're just going to be, at, you're never going to reach the potential that you could have if you just set a specific goal. Like I said, like uh, I've just had to decide, like I am a 1500 meter runner. Like that, that's what I am. So don't, yeah, you can run all distances, but don't really worry about them or don't just because a race becomes available, decide to run it. If it's going to upset your kind of training or you're going to start making rash decisions just because you're not running well at that time. So just train with a specific goal uh, in mind because at the end of the day coming up with a training plan is specific like they're there for a reason and your training has to be tailored around your different periodizations of what you actually want to do generally for me it's running well in the summer around june july august ultimately that's what it is and then um, i did have a third one yeah yeah the third one was pretty much when you're you got to run without fear and that's kind of one thing i've I've kind of got, I feel like I've got better at um, and probably didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities I felt I got when I was younger just because I just thought things were just going to, like if like if you looked at my progression since I've been 18, like it was, I don't think you could write a better pro progression up until you're 22. Like I went 342, 340, 337, 335. You, you think you're going to run 333 but you never know what's around the corner. So every opportunity you get, you have to run with, without fear. And a lot of times athletes do run with fear because it's innate that we don't want to get bet by people and we don't want to lose in Ireland or, you know, we don't really want to put it out there because if we do put it out there and it's not good enough, well, then we're afraid that we actually aren't good enough. So I think it's really important for people to, and it's a skill, 
that that needs to be practiced. Like I see a lot of really, really good runners out there that probably aren't and included. I feel like I've done it at times myself where we haven't really put it all on the line because for whatever reason, it's, it's the hardest thing to do. And the true, like the true champions and the true really good runners, they, they always put it on the line. They run without fear and that's how you get your, your best results. I think anyway. Yeah, and like just to follow up to that, because you've obviously spent extensive time training in a professional group with the Melbourne yeah. Track Club. A guy like Stuart McSwain is one of the yeah. best distance runners in the world at the moment. For outsiders, like, what is the difference in terms of how true pros like that go about their business, or is there a big difference in terms of their approach to sport? Is it just that they're more talented? What did no, you see when you were no, out there? No, it, 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 I, I feel like it, listen, it's not just one factor. It's a it's a cumulative things. Like one of the biggest thing I know was when when I went to Australia was the mentality was completely different, and it was something that I feel was my biggest asset when I when I came out of that. I feel like a lot of times, and I I have been subject to this myself, where you're you're going into a championships and you're hoping you get in the 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 fast heat so you can qualify as a because there's eight spots instead of four. Do you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, like, what happens if the race is slow? Immediately, subconsciously, you're thinking, oh, well, I wanted the fast heat. You know, so these guys, they don't think about, they think, all right, what's the automatic qualification, right? It's, it's top four. Do you know what I mean? And that was one thing that, uh, like, going into the Europeans in 2014, I had my mind made up that I didn't care what way the race was going. I was prepared for anything. It could have went anyway. I was trying to get top four. And the, these guys' mentality, it, it, it's a cultural thing as well because you tell someone in Australia that you're a, and it's same in America, that you're a professional sports people, and people think, oh, that's cool. You know, that's great. Jeez, how they kind of, yeah, it's not really like a, 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 it's not really a big deal. Whereas you feel in Ireland, you tell someone you're a professional sports person, they're like, what? You run for a living. It's like, what's that about? Like, that's not, that can't be your job. You know what I mean? So that's something we have to address that we, 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 we just know that we can compete at, at these levels. And the guys are no different from some of the guys that I train, but they success breeds success and all these guys hang around together and the competition is, is very high and the mentality is, is very good. Like, listen, you just have to look at a guy like, like Stewie. Like he's, it doesn't matter. He could literally run 332 on his own. It doesn't matter who's in the race now. And then like he goes out and he actually runs like that. He, he, he's a guy who epitomizes running without fear. And it's probably, it's it, like I felt such a, when I even went over there in, in the summer, like I didn't really think, I didn't know how good a shape I was in, but I laid it all out there. You know what I mean? And I started going through, like in my last race, I went through in 154, which it's only the second time I've ever done that. And I ran, I blew up, but I still ran 338. Do you know what I mean? But I don't think I would have done that if I hadn't been chatting to Stewie the day before. And he literally goes, I go, well, how fast do you get out in these 1500s? And he goes, I literally go flat out for 300. And I go, right, I may, may have to start going flat out. Next year. Um, yeah. So I'm conscious that we've ticked past the hour here and I don't want to run on too long, but we've had a few questions come in that I'll try to ask. Um, Rory Mulholland said it appears you're all doing too I'm guessing that's probably a reflection of the volume of this or do you view your long run sometimes as a as an extra Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, so in response to that question I'd say um for me it's always two sessions in the long run. Um which is kind of because I know just I know whatever way it happened, I kinda of just started doing it naturally. I've always kinda of squeezed my long run a little bit harder. Um than my other days. Like like on my easy days I'd never really so say like a Monday, Wednesday and a Saturday, I'd never really go any faster than um like six fifty a mile would probably be as fast I'd usually go on those days. Maybe a little bit faster, but that'd be that'd be about it. Whereas uh typically on my long run like I'd probably go kinda of a little bit closer towards like six ten, six minute pace, kinda of just I know I just tends to just progress through the long run. A lot of it is just because like, you know, if I have a sixteen mile long run I'm just I don't want to be out there all day. Like so I just tend to just progress it naturally as I go through it. And then like the two sessions a week would always be either Tuesday, Saturday or Tuesday and Friday. And it, I'd always try to keep them on the same days and stuff, but it's more just the uh, intensity um would would differ like at the moment now I'm just doing two kind of like 
aerobic hard sessions, whereas kind of general rule of thumb uh, in and around race season is that I always keep one just purely aerobic session in uh, in the week, which is usually on the Tuesday, like, um, you know, just something really just proper bread and butter stuff, like, you know, K-Reps, mile reps or anything like that. But then, like, we go kind of more specific, usually go to the track on a Saturday morning and, you know, kind of get stuff ready for, uh, you know, just getting getting the body ready for, for racing and stuff like that. But um, in terms of three sessions a week, I think, like, you know, the slightly faster long run probably ticks a different box to the other two sessions without it being massively strenuous. Um, so that's that's about as much as I do in terms of that. Cool. Amy, is it always two sessions a week? Sometimes yeah, two three. sessions and my long run, but I guess my long run has pick-up miles, so I would kind of class that as a session. Um, but, like, coming up to races, at the moment now, I wouldn't, like, go mad in my sessions. Like, I'm nice and controlled, and that's grand, but I do, like, I remember Jarrah saying earlier there, he was talking about that last rep. Like, I'd be the same. I want to flake it on the last rep always. Like, I've always been like that since I started running. Um, so I guess, like, more coming up to the season and stuff, my Tuesday and Saturday sessions like really in race time, I would be flaking it like coming up to the end. So I don't really think there'd be room for a third session. So I would definitely, I have like my two main sessions and I would almost count my long run because there is a bit of tempo um, at the end. I would count that as a small bit of session as well. Cool. Paul? Uh, uh, at the moment, yeah, I said I was doing two, but I would pretty much have always done three throughout my career. Um, it's probably something I just changed this summer because the way lockdown was and, just getting to specific training sessions was a bit more difficult that we went to two and and looking at at, at that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I would predominantly do three with a long run, but I would never look at my long run as a session. Cool. Yeah. Um, we had a question there from Bernard O'Hanlon, and it's a fun one. It's about booze. Um, he said you're all reasonably relaxed around nutrition, but what's your feelings on alcohol? Is it a GAA style drinking ban for the season, or is the occasional drink allowed? Um, if we start with you, I, I, I reckon oh, yeah. I, I should go first on that considering I probably should be most experienced so I take the floor first. Paul um, I wouldn't very rarely have drank uh, up until I probably started getting the majority of my injuries just because I never really had time to be a casual drinker it would have been always like most athletes just uh, the occasional binge after a uh, event um, so yeah, would never have drank. Probably became more regular drinker as I probably got older. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, I think I've really kind of think over the last kind of, I think the last kind of six months has kind of shown to me that you can't really afford to be, to, it's a bad habit to get into. Listen, one or two beers is fine, that, but I, I like going out and having to crack too much and generally be, two beers becomes 10 beers. So I try to... Uh, stay away from that just because you can't you can't do it listen none of the top guys are going out having loads of points and having loads of wine so any 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 real top sports professional apart from maradona maybe but uh that 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 yeah i just don't i don't i try to stay away from it now yeah cool dara you're obviously into the throes of college now and then obviously it's very different to normal college life but um how do you kind of try to balance that, I suppose, being a normal 19, 20-year-old with trying to be an athlete? Um, yeah, like, typically, I, like, I, to be honest, I agree with what Paul says. I don't really think there's any room for it in, like, in the middle of a training block. And I think probably more so just because of my age and, like, the way people my age socialise, like, like, you know, having, like, a glass of wine with dinner just doesn't happen. Like, I'm sure that's grand, like, or even having a few. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know because, like, like, if you know, in the same way I periodize my training, like, I do actually, and, you know, it kind of sounds like I'm, I'm taking the piss, but I kind of periodize the way I socialize as well, like, um, like, I always know when my last race of the, of the season is going to be, um, and, you know, I'll make sure I have, like, social events I don't want to miss, like, lined up for that weekend, like, so say now, like, after I finish my leaving search, um, you know, I had the Europeans on the 21st, I think it was, of July, um, so like I wouldn't have drank probably since March until after the Europeans and then I had three weeks essentially where I just drank most most of the time because like I had like two Debs um, you know a festival uh, like a leaving to a holiday all these things that like you kind of miss out on when you're training like I just when I'm not training then I try and just squeeze them in because to be honest after 
a couple of weeks like that, it's it's a long time before you like even well for me it's a long time before I'd even want to go again like. Um, so essentially, yeah, it'd be the same thing now. Usually now it could be different this year because of the way the calendar is. But most of the time, like you know, Eurocross is the last race before Christmas, and that's like usually about like the ninth or tenth of December. So like you know, like I'd really probably drink like September, October, November, December. But then as soon as that race is over, like I same thing probably just have a couple of like a couple of weeks of just enjoying myself and then going back to it again so I actually think like it's probably not like I'm sure you wouldn't read it in any you know in any book that's like scientifically backed up but like for me I just find the best way to as you said try and live as normal a 19 year old 20 year old life as I can is that like when I'm training I'm training and when I'm not I'm not essentially um and I think like you know if if it was the type of thing that like my like my friends or my family like regularly has you know two or three bottles of beer with your dinner like I don't think it would make that much of a difference if you did it once a week but it's just I'm just not in the habit of it like so I just I wouldn't go wouldn't just wouldn't really do it like cool and Amy when can and when can't you kind of go on the, the smash uh, for want of a better word or the half smash yeah I mean I'd be of the same um, opinion as the lads but. I would never, I wouldn't be massively strict on it. Like I remember in 2018, um, I went out the week before I ran, it was the first time I broke 420 for the 1500 and I felt absolutely amazing. But in saying that, I hadn't gone out for maybe two or three months before that. Um, I think as runners, there is a thing where it's like, we obviously don't get to go out much. So then when we're out, we're out, like out, out. So like, I feel like I'm not a person who would sit down and have a few casual drinks. Like that just does not appeal to me. But like, like Tara was saying at the end of the season, um, I love going out and I will make sure like I, I'll get a festival, a holiday, everything. Um, because I do think we need that at the, at the end of the season. But in peak season, like I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm not drinking now because you just don't have time to think about that because you're thinking of racing. But I would definitely look forward to the nights out then at the end of the season. So. Cool. And I'll just ask one final question. Um, Paul Highland has asked as 1500 metre runners how do your threshold or tempo sessions differ from your kind of standard 5k 10k athletes or are they the same um, Paul I, will, I think, well, I think like, we're back I, round to you so you can take oh, sorry okay. go ahead sorry no I was just going to say like, I probably yeah I'd probably fall into the category more of a 5k runner um, but from what I know about like what you know the people around me to, uh, train like I think I think in terms of like threshold and tempo runs, they're all they're all fairly similar, and I think they're I I I I'm kind of of the opinion that you're doing it wrong if you're getting yourself too hyped up for those for those sessions because you're not you're not trying to break any records, like you know, like I um like I would train if I was if I was going out to do a tempo session and you know to say for argument's sake like my target pace was five minute miling and you know if there was going to be a group of two or three lads going five oh five. I probably just fall in with them, like you know what I mean, because I mean, like I think, like for what you get from having company, I don't think it's worth, like you know, the five seconds of a mile or whatever. Because like I would be very relaxed about my my threshold and tempo runs. I just think they're a real box sticker, like you know. Um, I think like when the time comes to be like hit, hitting everything. Sorry. And sorry, I was just going to say, and on your thresholds, is it generally just a one straight run through of like, you know, five or six miles or do you kind of break it up into 10 minute or yeah. eight minute sections? I actually, I actually never really do straight, straight through tempos. Um, I'm actually like, I, I have nothing against them. In fact, I actually, I used to do them um, sometimes with my coach, Dave McCarthy. Um, but um, no, before that, even, even with Steve Matlin, never really used to do anything longer than like two miles. Like, you know, like I, um, for me, like, I do, I work in minutes now with, with Emmett and Lizzie, so he starts working in minutes, so it's usually like, it's probably always about half an hour of work and just split up any way really, you know, like it could be six by five minutes one week or, you know, four by seven or whatever. Um, and it's all like, it's all just, you know, short recovery, you know, between 60 and 90 seconds recovery and just not really pushing the ball out too far at all. And uh, I think it's one of those things that, as I said, I don't think it's the type of session that you really have to get yourself massively up for that you need to go breaking any records in it because it it really is just one of those things that like I don't think the difference between running five minute pace and running five or five pace or five ten is massively different. Like I wouldn't be beating myself up if I was a couple of seconds slower than I was the previous week because realistically, you know, you're working in that zone and like when 
when you do go and do a lab test and you are getting like your your zones or whatever like it's usually within a few beats per minute so i mean like it could be say for me now my aerobic threshold heart rate would be probably like between 154 and 157 so like i mean like if i go five minute pace it could be 157 and if i'm five ten it could be 154 so like I, it's i think they're really the type of things that you need to just you know as i said just stick the box with them um make sure you're not going too hard and just getting a good solid effort in. Cool. And Amy, you mentioned yours are sometimes worked into long runs, a bit of tempo, and then some other, what, what's your usual way of doing threshold? Or tempo? Yeah, so sometimes it's at the end of my long runs, and then sometimes it will be on either a Tuesday or a Saturday mm-hmm. session. But, um, I mean, I, like me, myself and Grace, we would train together often, and like we would do the same paces, and she's obviously a longer distance runner, and I'd be 1,500, 800. Um, so I don't think there's much of a difference really for tempo. Like, um, in my opinion, the main differences would be then when you get to the sessions and like maybe track season, obviously then the 1500 runners would be doing different things to the 5k, 10k runners. But I mean, from my experience, um, like the tempo stuff and the threshold stuff all seems to be quite similar for, um, 1500 meter runners and 5k, 10k runners. But yeah, for me, it would be worked into my long runs. Um, and that would be maybe 6.30 to 6.50, seven minute pace. Um, and then if I was doing like a two mile tempo at the, in a session, it would be like 5.45 to six minute pace. Um, and yeah, that's just what I'm used to. But uh, for the most part, I think that it, it seems to be quite similar between 1500 meter runners and 5k, 10k runners. Cool. Oh, and Paul, you mentioned kind of often running like a, a single loop. Do you kind of generally do one straight run of temp or threshold or do you break it up a bit? Um, I usually just do do one uh, straight threshold. Um, yeah, and pretty much what I do is like, like I said, I would have always got tested early on. So I would generally know if I'm going too fast over, I feel like just over my career, I, I, I generally know. How, I, I work off a lactate tester, so I would usually try to keep it around three millimoles. And I, I actually have one of the testers myself, one of the kits, and I also have my own treadmill. So every now and then, like I, I did it a couple of times on myself, uh, just to make sure I'm not going too hard. But I would always generally just stay on the the lower end. And usually, the, the main difference between how I do my threshold and a 10k or a 5k, they're just faster. That's pretty much it. And I think the biggest mistake people make is going too too hard on the threshold, especially if you're doing three sessions a week. Um, generally the guys and I, I would see because I predominantly train in a lot of training groups and we would all do threshold together when it's an individualized thing do you know what I mean you see guys running at other people's threshold and it just really it, it doesn't make any sense do you know what I mean and generally the guys who are going too hard on the thresholds can't keep that quality up in the other two sessions so it's pretty it is a very important one because i think it you know it it really gets you fit but also it can be the most detrimental because if you get it wrong it can actually mess up your whole week's training because Mm. all of a sudden you're you're fatigued going into every other session when you should have been feeling a little bit fresh excellent well there's been some fantastic insights from all three this evening so thanks very much dara amy and paul for taking the time and the grace for organizing. I should just say before I sign off, 